Welcome aboard, everyone. Um, so, uh, for anybody that's not joined us before, uh, welcome. Um, I've just been on the chat looking at um, where everyone's from. I've seen Bristol, Dusseldorf, so welcome wherever you are in the world. Um, so, yeah, Accelerate, um, we're, we're, we're hosting events now uh, online for obvious reasons. Um, so, a bit of a backstory. Uh, previously, we would um, do physical um, offline events. Uh, now we're focusing on webinars, um, summits, etc. So welcome to Scaling Inbound Lead Generation by Accelerate. Um, we've got five really great speakers coming along today. Um, myself, I'm hosting. Um, I will also be presenting uh, LinkedIn tactics to drive lead generation to your business. Um, I'm commercial leader at Accelerate, by the way, so I look after uh, sales and marketing. Uh, we also have co-founder and search director, uh, Nick Brown. Um, he'll be talking about how you can scale your content marketing for SEO and lead generation. Uh, we also have uh, one of our lovely clients, Zhao, uh, from Brightpearl. She's a global head of lead gen over there. Um, she'll be talking about how she achieved 60% growth in lead gen in one year. Uh, we also have our co-founder and analytics director, uh, Phil Pierce. Uh, he'll be talking about the 10, top 10 ways uh, to make or save money using GA for lead gen websites. Uh, and finally, we have our headline speaker, Sam O'Brien, uh, and he'll be talking about how he helped scale growth to uh, 1 billion annual recurring revenue, pretty impressive, uh, with SEO, uh, CRO, and content marketing. So there's a nice mix of um, clients and conversations that we'll be having today. Um, in terms of timing, um, I appreciate it's a two-hour session, um, so some people might dip in and uh, dip out. Uh, I'll be talking from now until about 15, uh, 3.15. Um, Nick will be talking from 3.15 to 3.30. Um, Zhao will be talking from 3.30 to 3.50. Uh, Phil will be on from 3.50 to 4.10. And Sam will be on from 4.10 to 4.30. So um, if you do have any questions, feel free to just ping them across um, through the Q&A um, uh, function. Um, but please bear in mind that we will be um, answering all questions at the end. So we'll blitz through the, the, the presentations and take it from there. Um, so a bit of a backstory about Accelerate. So we're a, a global uh, inbound lead generation agency headquartered town in Bristol. Um, so we work with clients all over the world. Um, I'm sure you can see some household names there, uh, as well as two, two of our lovely clients, which are talking today as well. So that's Ring Central and Brightwell. Um, so yeah, we work with a, 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 a massive host of different companies, um, some SaaS, some tech, um, some publications, etc. cetera. Um, you, you are able to get a, uh, a copy of our ebook. Um, which is on Amazon at the moment for, for SaaS and tech businesses. Um, and that's titled How to Rapidly Scale Your SaaS Business. Um, if you want to get in touch with us and get a, a free ebook copy, or alternatively, um, you can order a $14.99 paperback version uh, and we'll all sign it. And I'm sure it'll be worth uh, millions of pounds in, in years to come. Um, so I'm going to be presenting how to utilize LinkedIn to drive lead generation. Um, LinkedIn is a big part of what I do, um, and I'm seeing a lot of people use LinkedIn, um, but there's some aspects of improvements that, that can be helped, uh, which are what I'll be talking about here. So uh, what we'll cover is uh, the difference between paid and organic and why we favor one of those, uh, how to grow your LinkedIn connections and followers, um, growing your followers for an event uh, or a specific end goal, uh, and content marketing for LinkedIn. So paid or organic, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gray area. Um, we prefer organic because it's free. Um, organic is obviously free social media. Um, it's a combination of earned and owned content published for a company's own social channels, if you didn't know. Uh, and paid advertising is obviously uh, advertising or sponsored content kind of in a name you pay for it. You'll typically see sponsored or uh, advertisement label on certain posts in your newsfeed. We tend to favor organic. We put a lot of time into it. We find the cost per click and the cost per lead is often quite hard on LinkedIn. Um, we never had much success of it. So, um, and plus organic spring. The only difference is it takes time. So you would have that time investment as opposed to um, the cost investment. 
So I'm going to be talking a bit about how you can grow your LinkedIn. Um, so how can you do it, basically? Um, is there a strategic way you can do it? Yes, there is. Growing is pretty simple. Um, the hard yards are at the start. Um, so it's actually predicted that nearly 50% of companies with um, 100 employees or more will use LinkedIn marketing in 2020, but will they be using it effectively? Um, to start, to evaluate any social channel, especially LinkedIn, you want to identify your target persona. So it's worth noting, where do your customers hang out? Do these customers, um, are these on, on the specific channel that you're going to be using? Um, you can do this via customer interviews or just literally reaching out to your buyer persona on LinkedIn and, and asking them. So for us, um, it's senior marketers. Um, our target is B2B companies, SaaS and tech, so oftentimes they tend to be on LinkedIn. Um, both RingCentral and Brightpool came across this via, I think it's from events and leadership content on LinkedIn. Um, so it, it proves it does work. So um, some, some really simple tactics to grow uh, your LinkedIn. Uh, for us, there's, we treat it as two separate campaigns. So the first of which is brand awareness and building up your general following um, for, your, for your LinkedIn. Um, and the second point is using a targeted list of companies um, and that's for a specific end goal, i.e. for us, uh, we tend to use events as uh, a new biz driver. So really simple. It can be a little bit time consuming. So what I would do Get on your phone, um, search digital marketing manager or relevant um, job title. Um, and then you can also do second and third connections uh, and then just ping them out. The difference between doing it on um, a desktop and a phone is that you can do it much more speedy on a, uh, on a mobile phone. So I would always suggest doing it that way. Um, you, can do this, you can do this yourself uh, or you can use a marketing assistant or someone junior to, to take up this task if you haven't got the, the time to do it. Um, one key point to mention is always remove connections that don't accept. Um, if you've got a backlog of pending invitations, uh, you hit a ban and then you aren't allowed to send out any more connection requests. Um, now, growing your followers and connections for an event or a specific end goal. So events, they're a massive part of our biz dev strategy. Uh, so we host online and offline events. Um, they're a great way to get your name out there, get in front of those target personas. Um, so to start, we would always identify a target list of prospects similar to the brand awareness slash follower building strategy. This one's highly targeted. Um, so to summarize, brand awareness is obviously the broader network, creating connections um, and getting people familiar with your brand. And then also have your targeted list of people that you want to reach out to for a specific um, angle, i.e., Ours is going to be for a Reading event, which I'm going to use as an example uh, throughout the slides. So um, to start, what I would always do is build a list of companies. We've done this via Crunchbase. Um, we've created a template document where we can just rinse and repeat for each different event that we do. Um, within the different companies, we've identified two or three decision makers. Typically for us, they tend to be in sales and marketing. Um, so marketing managers, lead generation, uh, and then we cross-reference those people with LinkedIn. Um, and again, this can be done yourself or you can do it via a marketing person. Um, so you want to make sure this all feeds back into your content marketing strategy as well. So you want to ensure when you are promoting an event or you're sending out requests for an event um, and sending out those messages, you ensure you have consistent messaging along the social as well as the outbound messages. Um, you can promote the event via Meetup, um, Eventbrite, blogs. Um, we use Bristol Media. That's one of our media platforms that we use, and we do free and paid events. Uh, and obviously, you want to um, allocate different sort of resources to each, each event. Now, the main form of promotion for um, our events are via LinkedIn, which feeds back into the content. Um, and we actually get 50% of attendees to our events via LinkedIn, outbound messages, and also content marketing. So in terms of a strategy, I treat it exactly the same as an email marketing campaign. The only difference is, is that it's manual. Um, so personally, uh, from the agency's perspective as well, I would avoid automation platforms. They're just too risky when you're sending out outbound messages. And you want to limit the risk and make sure that all those connections, all that, all that base that you've been building 
is not at risk of, of being lost. Once you're banned on LinkedIn, you're banned for good. So that's always a, a point worth mentioning. Um, so yeah, what I do is track um, and create a, a sequence of manual reach out messages inviting those people to the event um, and then provide content. Um, for example, we use uh, free SEO tools that people can just go in and get a quick audit. Um, and is also a, a good lead gen driver for us as well. Uh, another way we do it is uh, write on trend blogs that link to the event and then promote via our social media channels to generate traffic. Um, one um, interesting point that's always worth mentioning, and when you are sending out outbound messages, um, try to avoid hitting 250 mess messages per day. Um, I've nearly been banned myself, so I would make sure, for, for me, for example, I would stick to around 150 messages per day and, and try and alter those messages as well, but make sure you're tracking all of that in a spreadsheet. So the content marketing for LinkedIn. Um, the main point is get organized. So I would create a content plan for a webinar. You can find loads of really good um, content plan um, spreadsheets online. For example, Hootsuite do a really good one and then treat it as a campaign in itself. Uh, make sure you've got that planned content. What is that content being used for? Is, is a question that you've always got to ask yourself. Um, don't be afraid to ask for reshares from your employees and your partners um, to get that maximum exposure. Um, and then always write on, on, on trend or relevant uh, blogs with call to actions linking to sign ups on the blog. Um, a good example of one that we've done recently is a work from home um, and also a COVID-19 blog. Um, and then that links back into the webinar. So we're creating links everywhere and then we're sharing all around social media. And then you can also post these pieces of content on media sites as well. Um, so a few LinkedIn tactics um, that maybe people don't know or they're not aware of at the moment. So how can you really optimize your content for maximum engagement? So um, what we've done is A, B test times, which you can get the most engagement on um, when you're putting up posts. Um, for example, for us, 8.30 a.m. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays works the best for us. Um, when you are putting that content in, as you can see, in this um, screenshot up on the right, um, the call to action is in the sign up um, and it's telling people to sign up. The reason why we do this is for when people are on mobile, they can go and click right into the link without reading the whole post. Um, also tag the relevant people and companies you'll be talking about them. As you can see, this is about our webinar. Um, we're working with Bright Paul and Bring Central on this. And then we have all the speakers who so are tagging each one for maximum engagement. Um, and the final point to mention is uh, only use free hashtags. Um, LinkedIn's algorithm stops following if you don't limit them. Um, so make sure your hashtags are not only limited to free, uh, but also relevant and researched. So it's all good having this content um, posted up for a specific angle, um, but it's also key to have evergreen content. Um, so to get people engaged with your content, go viral, post stuff that you think might go viral. If you've seen something else go viral, repost it. Uh, mix up your content so you've got specific end goal content, uh, as well as getting people to engage with your brand and, and having um, the, the specific end goal content. Um, so I've got a few examples of uh, content that we've curated and reshared. Um, this one here was uh, just about logos um, and how branding works for logos. Um, as you can see, this amassed nearly five, uh, 500,000 views um, of the post, uh, as well as nearly 7,000, well, just over 7,000 engagements. Um, and so here's another one that we've done um, that amassed 1,300 um, engagements, as well as 25K views. Um, and then another one where I actually went and tagged the CMO of Burger King. Uh, this is a bit of an old post, uh, but this amassed 300,000 uh, views as well as only 5,000 um, engagements. So this is a, a great way to keep people engaged with your brand, not just having the same company content, but as well as keeping people sort of really, really engaged with it. Um, yeah, like I said, any questions, um, feel free to fire away um, in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end if there's any questions about LinkedIn. Um, Going to be going on to um, Nick's presentation now. So I'll stop my screen share. Cool. So Nick's going to be talking about how you can scale your content marketing for SEO and lead gen. 
Um, so I'll let him introduce himself briefly, um, and then um, yeah, we'll. Hi everyone, I was on mute, so. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nick, I'm the Search Director here at Accelerate. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is uh, scaling your content marketing for SEO and lead generation. So what I'm um, just going in for our clients again, thanks to have uh, Red Pole and Ring Central with us. So what we cover, um, who you should target, uh, customers and partners personas, content market strategy, uh, building lists and content collaboration. Okay, so um, customer and buyer personas. We think this is obviously really important to really understand who your customers are and who your potential customers are. So, um, so move beyond customers to identify specific individuals as well within those companies. So why do um, customer and buyer interviews? So ideally you want to event topic, sorry, uh, Topics for your ideal customer would be interested in. So if you're writing about something, you need to have something which is going to appeal to them. Discover your the most popular sites where you should be um, guest post blogging, where your buyers hang out. Understanding their tone of voice, what is their demographics? You know, what sort of uh, age groups are they? Uh, what do they? What are they interested in? So on and so forth. Uh, learn what type of content they like to consume. So is it video, is it content, is it thought leadership articles? Uh, why someone has signed up to your service, so what originally, what, what appealed them about yourself? Why did they join you? Uh, what was the reason they decided to leave? This is obviously really important. So people that have left you, why do they leave? Um, is there anything you can do to improve? Or why do they not sign up with you in the first place or sign up with someone else? And obviously a lot more difficult to get these, but you know, with a, a few Amazon vouchers, it, it can be quite a good incentive to actually get them to help you do the interviews. And what are the pain points? What are they trying to test? What is your service providing for them, uh, which, uh, they, which will make their job easier and life easier? And what is their decision-making and buying process? So um, another thing I'm covering as well is partner personas. This is really important to obviously really successfully scale a business. Uh, you need to obviously work with partners. So ideal partners are companies which you don't compete with at all. You don't compete with for budget as well. That's really important. Um, people that offer complementary services. So people that um, have a lot of synergy with what you do and a very similar ICP, which is, um, sorry, uh, ideal customer profile. And also do they have an authority website, so a decent website, which obviously brings in a lot of traffic. So you're obviously collaborating with these people is the best approach. Um, why should we work with partners? So educating your partners on what you, should, what you do. You want to work together on content and leads. I'm gonna cover this in much more detail later. Uh, you work together on lead sharing and sales, going after the same clients. And do they fit your ICP, your ideal customer profile? Okay, so now we're going to cover content marketing for SEO leads in a little bit more detail. So this is what we kind of use quite often. We kind of use a variation on this where we kind of uh, go around the loop here a little bit more, a few times. So the first thing you should always do when you're uh, creating content strategy is focus on your keyword research and your industry intuition. What are people interested in? So you could be going after certain keywords that write your content about, which only have a very, very, very small volume of traffic, but they could be, your buyers could, could be researching that quite a lot. Um, then it's sort of the case of getting that content out there, publishing it, pushing it to email, promoting it by your social channels, and then earning links. But the best way to obviously earn link is to go back to the cycle here and doing keyword research, but then getting that content onto partner sites, but also guest posting, and working with partners to get some links as well for you. And so we go around here and it sort of increases your SEO organic traffic as well as getting referral traffic as well. So we follow the 80-20 rule, which is you spend 20% of the time actually writing your content, getting the content ready on your site, and 80% of the time should be on your uh, off-site promotion, social, guest posting, working with partners, promoting it as much as possible. 
That way you'll get the maximum impact for the great content you've written for your site. Another thing we want to cover is obviously when you've got your content ready, um, it's also to make sure it stands out. So you've got a nice big headline that really stands out and people will be interested in clicking through to. So this one, for example, has UK's number one business VoIP provider, as well as the number one online booking system. So a couple we've written here, which make it stand out. Uh, you can use capitals as well. So what I'm covering now is going back to the sort of beginning part of the content flywheel, doing your keywords research, which is kind of critical. So here's some tools which we use and we strongly recommend. Keywords Everywhere is quite a cheap tool. I think it only costs $10 and you get 100,000 keywords. So us as an agency, we'll probably get through $10 in maybe two months. So it does, it's very cost effective and it gives you lots of really great data like here. It shows you the volume of searches, uh, competition level as well as if you were to pay for it, uh, cost per click. Google Search Console is a great tool as well. Um, that's one we use quite a bit because it shows you what's going on with your organic traffic already on your site. Um, and there's Ahrefs as well, which is a pay tool. Um, and SEMrush as well, another pay tool, but I do go into detail later about how you can get those quite cheaply to start with. Okay, what I'm saying is with Keywords Ever, it actually integrates with your Google Search Console. So you can see what keywords you're ranking for. For example, I've got one here, which is SEO agency. And if you see there, um, it's got the volume, the cost per click, and the actual competition level as well. So it's great to use these tools together, but finding out what your website's already ranking for. It might be on page seven, it might be on page eight, but it has potential to get to the top of page one. Okay, um, get help with content on your website. So I'm gonna cover more about partners, but this is all about um, getting great content onto great sites. So here's one on HubSpot. So they have a contributor's guidelines and they actually want people to help them to write really good content on their site. And this is one we've done before. I think we've done about 12 posts with HubSpot now. So we've got quite a good relationship with them. But it's about, but they also give you, um, do follow backlinks to your website and you can also use it in promotion. And you can use it um, in presentations like this and it's great for branding. Okay, so when we've chosen the right keywords, we want to check the SERPs. I've got an example here of Google Analytics tools when we first decided to, we wanted to rank for this keyword because we have built our own Google Analytics tool. So how are we going to rank this keyword to promote it? So what we looked on the SERPs and we saw that um, they're all list articles. So 25 best, the best, the best analytics tools. So we wrote one which was, I believe about two and a half to three times the length of any other article. So I think it was, yeah, the, the closest one was about half the amount of content. So we did a lot more detailed and more, more comprehensive and it ranked uh, in a very short time to the top of um, page on Google, the first page. So you're looking at what's ranking the SERPs, check if they're all authority sites, what's left the article, what's the search intent, and look at the backlink profile to see whether it will take you many links to get there. So then we move on to writing the content check the keyword intent. Uh, is it a blog post, a list post, or a sales page? Really important, what's ranking um, the easiest with the least amount of backlinks. Review the content from the competition. Your content must be better and longer. Make sure the content reflects your customer persona's demographics interests. So you want it to appeal to the right people and break up the article. So don't make a really long block of text because people just don't read it. It doesn't appeal to people. And um, you've got to use lots of images as well. So use tables, images, graphs, videos, graphics. So it's really interactive. And you know, generally, the way people search or look, read stuff online these days, they don't tend to uh, read big blocks of text. They tend to read really short paragraphs. And they like some images to break it up or go straight to headlines. Um, so obviously, to get content to do really well, um, you need to use a writer an editor and check it yourself. So you need to go through a couple of checks and some very um, good writers and editors. So you write for your user, but you also write for Google. So important to uh, use the keywords in the URL. So make sure it's straight in there. So for example, ours is Google Analytics tools uh, for the keyword we're trying to rank for. Um, you should always insert the keyword in the headline. Uh, use keywords in sub headlines 
and every three to five paragraphs add the keyword and include it in the metadata. Okay, now we're going on to build uh, lists. So this is how we build lists uh, when we're looking for prospects and partners. So how do we found, I think Kieran covered this uh, briefly before. So we uh, find use tools such as Crunchbase and Bitwith. Crunchbase, you can try it for free. So you can obviously go in, I think they do a seven day trial and pretty much export the data you need. Um, cost isn't that expensive, but it's $29 a month, but you have to pay a free year in advance. So if you just get a free trial, you can quickly use it. Built with this is a lot more expensive tool. Um, you think about £238 for not a lot of reports actually. And, uh, but it is great for data. But there is an alternative ways of getting the data from Built with. Um, I just quickly looked on Fiverr. I've actually used uh, some of this before. And this person, they have spelled purchase wrong, but I think they have done that so that Fiverr doesn't um, tell them off. Um, but you can actually get the tools, you can actually find these tools a lot cheaper elsewhere. This one's 42 compared to 238. We're getting the same sort of data, same data. And this person's got really good reviews, so they're obviously doing a good job. So now um, we've got our list, so we've worked out our list. Um, of potential prospects and partners, uh, we filter the data, and we want, basically want to check on tools like Ahrefs and SEMrush. So do they have an authority website? Uh, do they have decent traffic coming to the website so you can work together, collaborate on content, and is it going to be worth your time? So now you can check the quality and the traffic of the site, but this is a way of doing it for not a lot of cost. So with Ahrefs, they do seven dollars seven days for access, and with SEM Rush, you can actually they actually offer a seven day trial, but you can actually get a thirty day trial if you just do a quick Google search saying SEM Rush thirty day trial. And I've actually put a link into the slides to actually so you can get a thirty day trial. Okay, content collaboration. So now you're in the stage where you've built the lists, you found your potential partners, your potential prospects. You've worked out which ones have decent authority domains, websites, and now it's time to sort of begin content collaboration. So why it's important. So it's kind of a soft approach into a company. So you're not going in on a hard sale, you're going in a very soft sale. Um, you've got opportunities to work together on lead sharing. Uh, you can write a guest post on each other's sites, which is great to appeal to their customers. Uh, you want to kind of align with those posts of what you do with what they do so it's the customers see the synergy and you want to create so on decent authority sites more likely to result in referral traffic and they have a higher conversion rates you've also got like i showed you with the hubspot example uh, do follow backlinks which increase the authority of your website and increase organic traffic to pages on your website so and you can refer people and clients to club to um to guest posts like hubspot and so on so um, email outreach, so I'm sort of going back a bit here. Um, so this is a quick overview of how you outreach to a list. So obviously you've got um, built with Crunchbase to find your initial list, look at authority and traffic. You can use uh, email uh, tools such as Snob and Hunter, which will find you the actual people within those companies. You need to reach out so you focus on who would be your buyer for us, marketing manager, so we focus on them. And you use outreach software like Buzzstream, Ninja Outreach, or Pitchbox to automate the process as much as possible. Okay, um, you have to run an outreach campaign. So you use outreach software, uh, create a template, and create a follow up email. And if you get no response from the pers that person, you go on to the next person in that company. Uh, you reject anyone that sort of says, oh, you know, uh, ask for money to work with them and you go into much more detail with companies that are interested. So you give them a much deeper analysis. Okay, here's an example, which I'll share afterwards of an example, uh, collaboration emails, how you're working together on content, just more opener, but it's not a case of asking, but it's also giving something back. Would you be interested in working together on a content collaboration where we both benefit and help each other's audience and SEO. This is something as well I'm giving away which is a content collaboration spreadsheet. So it works together when you found the partners you want to work with. You work with them on your target pages, your target partners, 
content for you both to write for on each other's websites, uh, content guidelines, and what you might succeed in, in replacing. So what we've covered today is who you should target, your customer partner personas, uh, content marketing strategy, building lists, and content collaboration. And takeaways, um, tools don't have to cost you earth, uh, write content for your customers and Google. Uh, use outreach software for speed and time saving. Work on your list. This will be the most time consuming but most important parts. And I've incorporated the content collaboration spreadsheet uh, for you to use. Okay, uh, that's it for my presentation. And thank you, Kevin. Over to you. Cool, thanks for that, Nick. Um, yeah, I've, one thing I forgot to mention right at the start um, is make sure you are submitting your questions to not the webinar chat, but the Q and A function, and then we can come back to it later, and you won't get uh, they won't get lost. Um, uh, yeah, cool. So now we're on to Zhao. Um, so obviously Zhao uh, works for Brightport. She's the global head of lead generation over there. Um, so I'll, I'll, head, I'll hand over to Zhao and then she'll share her screen and then present her, her slides. Hello everyone. So just let me share my screen with you. So today I'm going to talk you through um, what we did to achieve a 6% growth in inbound lead generation at Brightpole. So just a little bit background about Brightpole. Uh, we are a retail operations platform for retailers, brands, and wholesalers. We automate all the operations uh, behind the buy button, um, including like inventory management, order management, warehouse management, uh, pause, uh, fulfillment and accounting, etc. And we have offices in Austin and Bristol. And the uh, so we are a vertical software. So the challenges for us in lead generation is we target a quite niche market and so we kind of limited by data. Sometimes we need to uh, just do our best guess to, to make a decision. And we also need to focus on quality rather than quantity in lead generation. So before we started uh, working on the, on the pipeline, to grow the pipeline, we, we've clarified two fundamental questions. What is the goal in marketing in lead generation and who is our audience? We call it ideal customer profile ICP at Bipel. So the first question is very important. The goal is really important for us. It gives us very clear directions to the team. And at Bipel, we we've chosen a very bottom funnel goal, SAO which is not that normal uh, in SaaS companies because this is more like a sales, uh, like a, a target for sales team. But we use this goal to make sure that all the um, marketing activities can be measured on, on the same target and our budget is spent on the leads that are most likely to convert into customers. And also by using this goal, we are aligned with the sales team. So we work uh, more closely with the sales team to move the pipeline. And the, uh, the audience, the ICP, uh, this is very important as well because we all our marketing uh, assets are based on the uh, ICP definition. So in a nutshell, we serve retailers, brands and wholesalers trading finished goods with a GMV between $1 million and $30 million. But this is not enough to really understand our ICP. We need to uh, break it down to persona types. So what we did is we created a persona map based on two indicators retail experience and uh, tax savviness. So we managed to break our ICPs into four types. And then we just looked at our customers and the uh, prospects to put them 
back into these four types to work out what are our most valuable uh, persona types. So the most uh, valuable one for us is the uh, ICPs with very, uh, ICPs highly experienced in retail and also in tech. And then based on the uh, the most valuable, the priority one persona types, priority two personas, we found customers which uh, who fit in these personas and did customer interviews to understand their uh, buying behavior. So what we did to achieve the growth, the first thing we did is based on the um, the target, the goal, which is I, uh, SAO, we just looked at all the, uh, the uh, campaigns, activities we've done in marketing, checked the historical data to understand which channel worked very well, which cha channel uh, drove the most uh, SAOs and which channel didn't really work out. So we realized that at the beginning we were spending 70% of our marketing budget and also our uh, human resources in top funnel activities. We were doing paid social ads, uh, email blast, and also some cost, like very costly advertising on third party media. And we even created a YouTube channel to promote content. But all these activities, they didn't really bring us any SAO in short term. They did bring us just some uh, top funnel leads. Then we didn't spend enough on PPC and SEO and also our website to uh, get the most out of these channels. So after this analysis, we decided to put 90% of our resources into the bottom funnel activities first, which are PPC, SEO and website. And we kept 10% of our marketing budget just for ad hoc campaigns. So the optimizations uh, we've done on PPC, the first thing is we, we identified the high SAO conversion keywords in pay, uh, PPC. And we spent all the, like we, spent the budget on these keywords to make sure that we are getting the most traffic from these keywords. And then after, uh, after that, we spent on some generic keywords as well, just to expand the, uh, the traffic. And the other thing we did is to lower the click through rate on our ads. This is probably opposite to most of the best practice in, in PPC. Uh, why we did that? Because we we are not really focusing on top funnel leads. Our target is to get SAOs, so we need to spend money on the most likely to convert leads. That's why um, on our ads we try to tell people that who we are exactly, who we serve. If they are not really our ICP, we don't really want them to click on our ads. So by, by doing that, we can kind of control the traffic to our landing pages and avoid spending money on just a pure top funnel leads. And then the third thing we did, uh, which was really important, is to improve the uh, landing page SAO conversion rate. We you, So we chose to use one page standalone PPC page because um, it's, it, it, it loads much uh, faster and also it um, avoids uh, any traffic leak. We did do uh, A-B testing on the PPC page to see if, uh, if, we, the conversion rate, if the conversion rate was better by adding a link to our main website, but it turned out that the conversion rate was worse. Uh, we just got less uh, people who booked a demo on the page, and also on that PPC landing on the PPC landing pages, we clarified our target market and the audience and who we are, just to make sure that people don't 
uh, book a demo uh, without really knowing who we are or who we serve. And the competitor pages are very important for us. So we spent quite a lot of time to optimize the competitor pages. We checked the uh, major competitors reviews on, on the internet and also got information from our sales team about our major competitors. Then we built dedicated comparison page to each major, uh, major competitor based on the information, the reviews we got from the internet and our sales team, which worked out really well. And the last thing we did on the landing pages is we created pop-up form on exit intent for a second chance. So by doing all of that, we managed to improve uh, 25, uh, improve click to MQL conversion rate by 25%, 74% on MQL to SAO conversion rate. And we also managed to increase the average order value by doing the optimizations on PPC. So which means we, we are getting uh, bigger customers from PPC. And then we also uh, try. Uh, we also tried to uh, get most out of the uh, website visitors. We realized that uh, only we only knew two to three percent of our uh, website visitors, and ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent uh, of website visitors they just stay uh, unknown. We tried for marketing campaigns, but it didn't really work out because we are targeting we 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 are targeting very niche market, and most of the website visitors they are not really our ICP. So what we did instead, we uh, we we started working with uh, Drift, which is a live chat software with uh, ABM function. Uh, so they helped us to identify the uh, website visitors. And once uh, ICP company is on our website, our sales team uh, got notifications and they could just uh, jump on the chat or send out an email directly, which helped us a lot to qualify the website uh, traffic and got a chance to speak, to talk to our ICP companies. Then we also made quite a lot of uh, optimizations on the website. So we tried to improve the conversion rate of our website first, uh, try to make sure that uh, the, uh, the track, like the visitors on our, our website could book a demo as much as possible. So the homepage is very important. What we did on the homepage is, we clarified who we are, who we serve, and highlighted our value proposition on the homepage. And then we used our, and we used different tools to identify the uh, critical pages for us. So we used website heat map tool to understand the, uh, the pages that our website visitors uh, looked at the most PPC search terms to understand understand the information, the uh, the type of pages uh, our prospect prospects are looking for, and then we also did some persona interviews to understand what type of content, what type of pages they are looking for. Um, so the uh, the found findings um, from all this data is we are the, uh, the type of pages that resonate with our website visitors are the most important, which means like, uh, so it's like pages like who we serve uh, by industry, by the platform, our pro prospects are using, they are very important pages. So we created all these pages to deliver right content to our prospects. And then we also used the uh, score percentage and the website heat map 
to understand if the navigation was good enough for prospects and also if uh, the content flow was right. Uh, the other thing we did is was on the pricing page. We so we have we have two pricing uh, plans, but we don't really tell uh, we can't really tell our prospects prospects the price is. So instead of just talking about the price the prospects would pay, we listed all the features uh, in included in each pricing. By doing that we saw our uh, conversion rates improved from 1% to 4%. And the last thing we did is on the book demo form, we added qualification questions on book demo form to make sure that our sales team uh, didn't spend time on uh, low quality leads. So as a result, uh, we improved the MQL to SAO conversion rate on our website by 20%. And we also saw uh, order, average order value uplift of 30%. And what we are focusing on now. So I think you've probably already heard of uh, account-based marketing. Um, so from an inbound perspective, we are targeting prospects who are in market, but they might not be our ideal customers. The account-based marketing is kind of the opposite. So we know that prospects are uh, our ICPs, are our ideal customers, but they might not be currently looking for software. So by combining both of uh, these mediums, we could reach more ideal customers earlier in their buying journey. So what we are doing now is we have a team to build ICP lists from all different tools we can find on the internet, like Zoom Info, uh, Built With, etc. We now we've uh, we've got a list of ten thousand companies, and and then. Because the, the list is growing, we can't really target all these ICP accounts at the same time. We need to prioritize them. Um, the tool we picked is Bombora, it's an intent data provider. They, the, this tool can tell us if a company is currently looking for a certain uh, topic. So we put into the tool the topics we're interested in and and the uh, ICP list and the tool just returns the uh, the companies that are currently looking for one of the topics which help uh, uh, helps us to prioritize the uh, ICP companies and then based on the uh, priority one companies what they are looking for we engage with them across different channels with personalized communications. And we also realized that by using very personalized communications emails, we, the click, through, click rate on emails or the response rate is much higher. The other thing we're focusing on is the uh, SEO. So uh, we, we tried to do SEO uh, ourselves we managed to grow the web traffic by about 15%, but we quickly realized that it was uh, very time consuming and we couldn't really grow the SEO at a scale by ourselves. So now we are working with Accelerate to grow our SEO very quickly. Uh, we I, th I think we do need experts to help to do link building, to create decent content to grow it. Uh, that's, I think that's all for me. Cool, thanks so much, Zhao. Uh, yeah, that was a very insightful um, presentation. So I appreciate you taking the time to present and um, giving us a quick shout at the end as well.
Um, so uh, on to um, our next speaker, Phil, um, and just double back quickly. Obviously, if you do have any questions that pop up, just put it in the Q&A for Zhao and then we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Phil's our um, co-founder and analytics director. He's got a wealth of knowledge in uh, pretty much most things digital, um, but uh, as well as analytics, which is his specialty. So uh, I'll hand you over to him um, and he'll uh, start with his presentation on top 10 um, Google Analytics reports to save you uh, money for lead gen sites. And over to you, Phil. Cool. Okay. Uh, and uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Cool. Okay. So, so this talk is uh, a little bit more of a sort of interactive one. Uh, so, uh, but just before we start, a quick kind of fun fact. So I'm an identical twin. So uh, I've uh, sort of cloned myself to improve my productivity, um, which uh, would be great. Although my twin brother is a tennis coach. So he's great at uh, improving bounce rate, but not really very good at doing much else. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I've been kind of involved in the sort of analytics industry for about kind of 18 years or so. So uh, uh, hopefully some of the, the tips that I'm going to share with you here will be helpful for you, especially for, with a kind of a lead gen sort of focus. Um, and uh, we've done lots of implementations of Google Analytics and GTM on hundreds of websites. So uh, wealth of kind of experience. Um, with this particular kind of talk, um, if you do have a Google Analytics account to hand and you're logged into it, like now, um, you're going to get the most kind of value out of this. And um, if you don't use Google Analytics, uh, just search for the Google Analytics demo account um, uh, and then you can get access to an example Google Analytics report. Uh, also, as we sort of go through this sort of talk and through these sort of slides, um, please kind of add bookmarks as you go because there's going to be stuff where you'll be able to sort of jump to a report or you might want to access it next week or, uh, you know, like this is really helpful. I need to kind of visit this again. So I normally suggest creating a little bookmark folder on your, on your, in, in Chrome or your browser and then just adding those useful or, or most helpful links. Um, well, as uh, Kieran mentioned, uh, we're going to do questions at the end once all the speakers have finished talking. So the aim of this particular presentation is to show you how to reduce uh, cost or media spend whilst maintaining conversions, uh, increase your conversions or revenue, or, or obviously leads, or automate the above two. So this is kind of the holy grail, you know, make me more money, uh, but don't spend any more. So uh, I've, I've kind of picked um, my sort of favorite reports or, or reports within Google Analytics, which I think will kind of help with that process. Um, it, in order for this to work uh, as best as possible, it's, we want to really try and use your own data from your own Google Analytics account. So uh, in order to figure out uh, what your, your Google Analytics account ID is, uh, if you log into Google Analytics, you'll see the ID along the top. Uh, now this is uh, it's a long, it's about a 32 character kind of ID. Um, it looks like this kind of gobbledygook one just here. Um, if you can pick any report um, uh, and you'll see the ID, if you could just kind of grab it and copy it and we're going to need it later. Now this is not um, your Google Analytics account ID, that's a kind of UA dash number one. Uh, it's actually the, uh, the number within reports. Um, I should mention there'll be a kind of slower version of this process that we're going through here on our blog. So if I'm going too quickly, uh, you can, there'll be a recording which uh, kind of shows you how to kind of go through some of the things that I'm going to mention within here. So the great thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize about Google Analytics is that if you find a really useful report, you can jump straight to it. Um, so um, in, uh, uh, and you can add that as a bookmark. Uh, so here, for instance, if there's a useful report in the content drill down uh, or somewhere else, bookmark it and it jumps straight back to that. And you can also set the time range to last 30 days or last four weeks. Um, so what I've done is I've picked 10 of these most of these reports as bookmarks so that you can jump straight to them. So you can jump straight to the analysis kind of bit. So uh, if I could just ask uh, if you could try this bit.ly link here. Now, this should go to a Dropbox link. Uh, which will allow you to download this text file um, of these uh, sort of favorite reports. Um, in Dropbox, uh, you should see a little download button in the top right. 
if you click on that and let's say do you want to save this file or download it if you download it and I suggest saving it on your desktop uh, or on your computer because we're going to need to edit this text file in a moment and you're going to need to paste in that account ID that we uh, we just mentioned uh, earlier uh, so once you've downloaded that file uh, which is just a, a notepad file which kind of links through to these bookmarks uh, you'll see within that file it has the word replace me so you can kind of guess what's going to happen next is you need to replace the word replace me with your Google Analytics account ID so uh, if I just jump to an example sort of here so if I just pick one of um, if I open one of these reports so this is the file that I've downloaded to desktop uh, uh, with the word replace me in it so if you just get your uh, account ID um, which is oops, uh, the one at the top here so if you grab that ID and then go to that notepad file and literally go uh, file and then uh, replace so literally do the word uh, replace me with that number without any space at the end of replace me uh, and then it should update all those links and you should hopefully see the word replace me has now changed to that long kind of number and uh, so uh, if you've done that right uh, you should see uh, you should no longer see the word replace me in that text file that you've downloaded instead uh, you'll see uh, your account ID in that link so um, if you check test this to make sure that it works so grab that link number one where it says best and worst landing pages uh, and just try and uh, open that that link and see see if it if it loads so you should uh, all being good uh, be able to grab this one here where it says best and worst landing pages uh, and just open that page directly like that uh, and it will then jump through to your best and worst landing pages uh, but this has a filter applied to it for both the time range and also for um, for bounce rate so um, it's sorted based off weighted bounce rate which basically accounts for for volume not just kind of best or worst so uh, you can click that toggle for bounce rate and see what's what's good and what's not so good um, so I'm going to sh show another example of this in a second I'm just going to jump back to the slides so uh, for, for purposes of, of demo um, on this I'm going to use the computer aid uh, website um, which is a kind of lead gen website the aim of the computer aid website is to either get people to donate their old computers for recycling um, which is worth approximately 50 pounds to them uh, as in if people fill in that form uh, or uh, if the visitors are a school from South Africa and they're applying for these computers it's to fill in the apply button you probably notice the computer aid website has changed since um, uh, uh, these slides were produced so the, the it looks slightly different to how it is on the screen but the the premise is still the same so um, within that list of, of text files of, of um, links um, if you jump to that first one of the best and worst landing pages um, you should see um, uh, yeah, it will probably have sorted via your worst page for bounce rate at the moment so uh, if we take computer aid as an example they were sort of buying uh, AdWords traffic which was targeted in English um, and they were getting quite a large volume of that um, uh, and it was a significant kind of media spend but the landing page was in Spanish so unsurprisingly the bounce rate for that page uh, was not uh, was not uh, very good so when you sorted via best or worst bounce rate it kind of bubbled up to the top uh, and you'll notice that um, uh, even though it's kind of sorted numerically uh, it's it's the the weighting of those sessions kind of uh, updates which is the most important so obviously that page is not making the money or not using that media spend as effectively as possible so it's an area they really need to kind of jump to uh, and fix 
Um, uh, and uh, also you'll notice there's a 404 page down here, but the volume of it is much less. So even though it's got a 90% bounce rate, it doesn't bubble up to the top because, because of the volume. You can also flip this report upside down. So if you click on bounce rate again, you'll see which of the pages which are the best for bounce rate. So what we're trying to figure out is uh, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, uh, and are people being able to get past at least the first page? I mean, if they're not able to get past that first page, they're definitely not going to be able to sort of fill in your, your uh, lead gen form and, and go into the, the, the funnel. So hopefully there's some nuggets within that list which you can, you can work on. Um, once they've got sort of the, the next thing you, you might want to uh, look at would be uh, which pages are sort of uh, um, uh, the most effective for generating revenue. Uh, if this was an e-commerce website, then you'd expect to see your, your thank you page or e-commerce complete at the end of that. For lead gen, it's probably going to be a, a thank you page URL. Um, as I mentioned that uh, for computer aid, each uh, conversion uh, was worth about 50 pounds for them. So, uh, and the, the steps leading to conversion are also sort of shown in here. So the inquiry form is performing pretty well in terms of uh, this sort of virtual revenue divided by the number of pages that people visit. So these pages are all really good at the top. They're kind of generating uh, revenue or leads. Pages down here at the bottom though, they're not doing anywhere near as well. So this one here, which has got quite a bit of sort of volume, um, but the, the sort of virtual revenue from this page, from this donation form is much, much lower than the inquiry sort of form. So something's not going right there. That uh, page is not, it's not generating leads. It's not generating sort of a uh, bit of virtual revenue for, for those leads. So it definitely needs investigation. Uh, and on the flip side, you know, you'd want to kind of get more traffic to that other form here, which is doing, doing really well. Um, uh, just as a point to note or caveat on this particular metric, um, if you've added uh, goals to your website for thank you pages, but you haven't added a value to those goals, be it £50 or whatever they're worth, then you'll see this number being zero. Um, that £50 is normally based off how much um, a form fill on the website is worth. So you'd have to account for the dropout rate between people submitting that form uh, and then actually becoming a sale. So you sort of uh, work backwards based off your offline conversion rate and your offline lead value to, to equate to what that number would be. Um, but yeah, again on here, normally there's some nuggets as to uh, do more of this, do less of that. Uh, and uh, if you have a site search on your website, um, there's uh, you can use the same process or same method to find out uh, which uh, keywords people are looking for, which is resulting in, in leads or sales. Um, for instance, this one here, people were searching for toner cartridges and they also then donated their old uh, toner because they did uh, sort of uh, toners and uh, printers, not just computers. Or if people search for a generic phrase of recycling, they also ended up uh, sort of completing a, a key action. However, there's this one down here, um, which is a product ID, which didn't result in, in um, a conversion. Um, and thus, maybe there's a need to kind of uh, redirect people that were searching for product IDs through to the next best relevant page or the uh, category page. Uh, just to kind of optimize those internal searches uh, or um, sort of doing did you mean or another technique that can work quite well is changing your default search phrase so that when someone is about to click into the search text box you have a kind of suggestion that subliminally reminds them to search for the thing that you want them to search for also on this list you'll notice that there were some people that searched for jobs uh, on the, the computer aid website that was not a key action for them so that's why there was no kind of virtual revenue assigned for that um, because it was a sort of mini goal not a, a main goal so uh, hopefully there's some again some nuggets within there that allow you to sort of take action and uh, and improve your internal site search performance um, another good one is uh, looking uh, at uh, sort of traffic to your site that's landing on a broken page. This is normally quite easy to identify because you can look at the page title. For instance, this one says the page cannot be found and then filter that to see where did they come from when they clicked on um, to get to the site. So this is the referral page. A computer aid uh, had a broken link on Wikipedia, which was sending a reasonable amount of volume. Uh, but uh, obviously they you know they really want that traffic to convert if you throw a 404 page um, uh, to people there it's like a conversion blocker it's kind of in the way they're not going to 
get that they're less likely to donate because it looks like something's not working uh, and also for SEO purposes that that Wikipedia link is really powerful you really want it to kind of point to the most relevant um, sort of uh, area on the website uh, as well so um, you again see what's kind of in this list uh, you can pull the same information out of search console but this is going to account for kind of click throughs and volume which you don't necessarily see in, in the search console report for, for broken links so it's actually I personally find this one more more sort of active and more kind of uh, helpful and you can also drill down into it even further by uh, finding the exact page, for instance, from Wikipedia that's broken. And if you can then edit Wikipedia, you can fix that or you can add redirects to the website to point to the, 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 the corrected pages. So um, as I said, this, that particular link in, that, in the list of, of uh, bookmarks, you may need to tweak what your page title is for, for it to work on that. So you can click the little, little drop down and search for the word, word found or 404. But so uh, that's the, the most common page title that I've, I've found. Um, so um, for, for time reasons, I'm now going to sort of jump to some other areas uh, to, for analysis. Um, um, so uh, uh, this is um, yeah, another core cool place to look in Google Analytics is there's a feature called Intelligent Alerts. So uh, it basically tells you something has changed. Now that could be either something's performing better or something's performing worse, uh, but it, it's kind of different how it was. Uh, so it's really good for like seeing, okay, what what's 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 bubbled um, and now uh, and then taking action on those bubbles so it's the little button in the top right that says insight and you'll see this in any Google Analytics report uh, if you click on it uh, now it does need a reasonable volume of traffic or, or data to be able to kind of bubble up with alerts uh, but you should see some sort of stuff in there um, for instance you know week on week performance or uh, referrals from a particular site performing well uh, or you know, conversion rate on some pages needs needs looking at. Um, uh, so again, it's going to show you you know what's good, what could be improved, uh, and give you an an idea as to what you should investigate. Once you found those areas, you could then do maybe kind of A/B testing on those landing pages, uh, or or tweak the the adverts that are pointing to those pages. Um, so another place uh, you can also see those sort of same alerts or, or changes would be um, in uh, the um, uh, uh, iOS or Android um, sort of, uh, uh, the stores. So uh, Google have also got a, um, uh, a sort of free to download uh, app uh, which you can install on your phone. And if you really want to sort of check kind of how your website is doing at the, in the early hours of the night or when you're sort of out and about, you can do. Um, uh, but the other most useful thing about it is those alerts that tell you something's broken or something's not working will bubble up in, in that report. So it's kind of a quick kind of check, but you could do it when you're remote or not necessarily sort of uh, at your desktop computer. Um, so um, uh, the, the only thing I would say about those alerts uh, or intelligent alerts is Google doesn't always kind of get it right. Uh, so um, sometimes it will pick something that's not really a problem. Uh, so uh, you can get around to that. You can add an automatic alert. So here's three that I've picked. For example, uh, if you've got uh, four or four pages that suddenly spike and you get a huge volume of traffic to those pages, you really need to do something about it and you need to fix it. Uh, and, and that would, uh, one note about this, there is a, a sort of 24 hour delay with these alerts being firing, but at least you kind of know about it and then you can jump in and take action. The same would apply on your conversion rate. You probably want to get an alert, be it a text alert or email alert, if your conversion rate is suddenly kind of down, be it by 50% week on week or, uh, you know, less than a threshold that you're expecting, or if your sort of goal value or average order value drops below a certain threshold, you need to kind of look at it and take action. So these are kind of your own logic that you can add into Google Analytics to kind of warn you if, you know, there's an issue with uh, sort of lead gen or revenue generation. Um, uh, another, so this is on the automation kind of side. Um, there's some dashboards that you can plug into Google Analytics, which can help you with kind of quick analysis. Uh, so uh, the dashboards you can access in Google Analytics by clicking the dashboard link on the left hand side.
uh, and then it will say add new dashboard and you get this little pop-up that appears where it'll say blank dashboard start dashboard or import from gallery if you click on the import from gallery uh, it will pop up uh, and then there's a list within there and within that list there's one that says lead generation within the filter so these are uh, other people's reports that they've created, which are designed to help with lead generation analysis. And the great thing about these reports is once you've added them, they stay there permanently and you can also share them with the team and other people that have access to Google Analytics. Now, when I tested these, the import button actually earlier today, uh, it wasn't always working. So uh, there may be some issues possibly with Chrome. So you could try it in, in Internet Explorer. Um, don't worry if it's not working. There's another way around it. Um, which would be, um, uh, and this is how those dashboards look once you've imported them. Um, the, uh, so we're going to grant you access to our kind of dashboards that we use for, for lead gen analysis. Uh, if you want to access those, just open that bit.ly link. So it's bit.ly forward slash um, uh, 20 hyphen GA hyphen dashboards V2. Um, and it will pop up uh, with uh, a list of 20 dashboards uh, and ask you which profile you want to kind of add those to. So select your main of Google Analytics profile uh, and press add, uh, and then um, you'll, you'll have access to those 20 reports. There is um, an extra step in that uh, with any dashboard you import, you have to also press the button to say, can I share this with, with all people? So when you add any dashboards by default, only you can see it within your login. Uh, so you could manually pick the most useful ones and then press, you know, share this with the team, um, but it, will, it won't, won't by default um, share it with everyone. Within that list, I've put a bunch of helpful reports. Some of them are real time. Uh, some of them are kind of SEO and PPC specific, uh, and then some are kind of high level analysis reports. Uh, on the automation side, uh, there's uh, Google uh, have a plugin for um, uh, Google Sheets. So Google Sheets is kind of like Excel. Um, this plugin is totally free uh, and you can actually set it so it updates every hour or every day. So any particular analysis or particular report that you really need to run or need to automate and you need to kind of look up that information in a, in a, in a sheet, um, this is an invaluable plugin. Uh, so to add it, just go to uh, Google Sheets, click on add-ons and then select get add-on um, and uh, and then search the word Google Analytics press install so it's an official Google plugin um, and once installed you can then set it so it runs at whatever kind of times you need it to run uh, and as I said totally free and there's an example of one of the reports that we use for, for automation analysis in Google Sheets just down there uh, and uh, as I said, we're, we're going to share links to the slides. So if I've gone through this a little bit quickly, uh, you can kind of go through it at your own sort of speed. Uh, that particular one, you can see it's just pulling out uh, a field, some uh, numerics, and then doing a comparison. Um, so sort of to summarize, um, I've picked kind of, sort of five or six kind of reports within that list for both weighted bounce rate to identify which pages uh, people are landing and leaving straight away on based on volume. So those are areas you really need to jump to and, and fix and correct. Pages that are not generating conversions, um, again, filtered by volume. Site search pages, which uh, are not you know, generating kind of actions and then analysis of, of broken pages, looking at the source and referral path, and then intelligent alerts and custom alerts. And um, there is some further kind of reports I've listed uh, within there, uh, such as transaction probability and conversion probability, and some grand, more granular analysis of AdWords data. Um, the, you can look at them kind of in a, in a follow-up sort of talk. Um, uh, but hopefully um, you've got some bookmarks that you can you can look at later for analysis. So if you found something helpful, you can jump straight to that point. Uh, and I would say if, you've, if you're able to visit those 10 places or 10 reports, a cool little tip or trick is you can download all of those PDF reports. So you have 10 PDFs and then search for free PDF merge and that will build your kind of analysis document with all of these 10 kind of uh, areas and that can then be useful for CRO and, 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 um, and, and you know, basically saying pro pro uh, providing analysis and, and recommendations document. Um, 
and as a summary this is not something you want to do as a one-off exercise you want to be continually monitoring and updating your site um, and and spotting errors correcting them um, and um, and doing that as a, a automated not a manual effort um, as a, a note I recommend two sort of follow-up sort of tools these ones are not free um, well one of them is is very cheap um, uh, but WordStream have a very good AdWord analyzer and Metric Story have also have a very good more detailed kind of e-commerce and um, uh, um, sort of AdWords analyzer so um, for both of those are sort of data centric and, and very good at anomaly detection and uh, sort of cost data analysis. Um, uh, and as I said, on our blog, we've got a video that explains the process that I've just walked through here. Uh, so that's top 10 Google Analytics tips uh, and uh, kind of walks through in a little bit kind of more time. So um, that's it for me. So I'm just going to hand back to Kieran. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, yeah, like, like I said, um, for the other conversations um, or the other presentations, should I say, um, feel free to put in a question in the q and if there's anything else you want to learn about analytics um, and feel free to schedule a call with us as well. So uh, next is our headline speaker, Sam O'Brien. Um, he's one of our clients over at Ring Central, uh, and he's going to be talking about how he helps scale growth, uh, growth uh, to 1 billion annual recurring revenue uh, using SEO, CRO, content, uh, content marketing. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoy. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, then just put them in the Q and A. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously not not all on my own, but uh, yeah, that's that's what we <laughs> achieved uh, uh, last year was a was a one billion revenue in uh, 2019. So a goal that we set for a long time, and obviously took a lot of work to to get to, but uh, we achieved it in 2019. So now onwards and upwards. Um, so quickly, I'll just go through who I am. Obviously. Sam O'Brien, as, as Kira mentioned, um, I've been at Ring Central for four years now, and really the talk is is just to go through like how we've used SEO, Crow, and, and content marketing to obviously not on its own to hit the billion dollar, but it's been part of our strategy moving forward. Um, this is pretty much what I want people to to get from the talk, and to be completely honest, a lot has been covered already from uh, Phil's talk and, and Nick's talk, and well, pretty much all the talks to be honest. Um, but really, we've, we've used SEO throughout the entire journey, uh, different to what Zhao said, where she's gone after it at the bottom of the funnel. We've used it for all stages of the funnel. Um, very much in line with what Phil spoke about is how we've used data to determine the content, but also to know where to shift our focus and, and what to focus on. Um, and then, yeah, Crow, just to, to really help amplify the, the campaigns we've run. So... Seeing as it is a work day and it's still work time, I'll quickly tell you who Ring Central are and, and, and what we do. Um, and also I'll just add in here as a little caveat that a lot of the campaigns I'm talking about today, we've been working on for a long time. Um, the reason I mention this is because with the current climate, it may seem like we're just jumping on current trends, but this has been stuff that's been in the works for a long time. So. At Ring Central, we provide cloud communications. Um, the goal is to make it easy and effortless for everyone. So I think everyone knows that, especially in the current climate, preferences have changed. People want to work from anywhere. They want to work on any device. And we see that in three major categories. Team messaging, like one-on-one -on -one or, or one-to-many via team messaging. Video meetings, such as today, and then like a, a cloud phone system, which allows you to take calls from anywhere. Um, and again, we, we work on any device, any mode and, and anywhere. Um, so pretty much this kind of aligns to, to what we've done with content where we've tried to create this plan where we are everywhere and by everywhere, I mean, you know, we've obviously got to be a little bit careful and not make sure we're just putting stuff out for the sake of it, but we want to increase our content and be at each stage of the funnel. So. When you get down to the bottom here, you, we look at the average buyer interacts with a business seven times. We want to make sure that we've been at each one of those stages and creating content, which is which is relevant to our buyers. Um, I, I really like this quote, and actually, Kieran, you, you spoke about this with LinkedIn, and I think it's really relevant. So with paid, you can turn it on and instantly you'll see gratification. You'll, you'll see leads come in, you'll see traffic come in. Um, it's really quick and it, and if you need to stand something up quickly, then turning on paid ads is, is definitely a way to do it. 
uh, if you're trying to build a long-term strategy, then SEO is going to be the way to go. Or, I mean, there's nothing saying you can't do both. And I think for us at Ring Central, we are definitely not saying, you know, do, do SEO overpaid. It's the case of doing them both. Now, what we reached at Ring Central was a point where PPC could no longer be scaled up. And what I mean by that is we, it, it, it wasn't a case of the budgets was limited. It was a case that we could no longer spend efficiently. So going back to like the cost per click and, and the cost per lead, it became so high because we were having to bid on long tail terms to continue to, to grow our traffic that actually it seemed better to start taking a much more content driven approach, um, increasing our number via like organic, organic avenues. So this is where we go into the funnel. And I think, you know, funnels are such a standard way of marketing now. People, most people know what a funnel is. Um, but I think what we did, and, and this is where I'm talking about current climate, we, we were kind of already creating this content uh, in like November last year, but we focused on increasing our awareness. And awareness for us, it's not going to generate leads necessarily. It's not going to generate a uh, closed business, but what it is going to do is it's going to familiarize people with our brand, who we are and, and what we do and start to help them understand our technology. So we've created loads of content around like digital nomads, working remotely, um, how to start working remotely, how to set up a remote business, all sort of content around this where we were able to, to I know this is corny because of the picture at the back, but we're able to cast a big net, right? And, and reach a lot more people. Whereas when we were focused on PPC, we're focusing on terms which we know the person's going to buy there and then. So increasing this awareness with, with content has enabled us to get more people to the website. So then we can start playing with that data and start playing with those users to, to move them down the funnel. So obviously from awareness, we move into interest. And I think, you know, for us again, it's like understanding the funnel, understanding the buyer's journey. But we find that once they know who we are, people are going to start self-selecting. So interest would be looking at technology, looking at how technology can enable remote working, looking at how um, maybe technology can help with productivity for remote workers or, or some sort of messaging around that. Um, we do then start using like retargeting methods to, to target back to the people to try and bring them back into the website. Whereas with awareness, we probably wouldn't retarget them because it's, it's more just a branding exercise. Um, then we get into consideration and this is content now, which we're really talking about our product suite. So we're trying to start, we're trying to sell the value and we're trying to help people, you know, see who we are and, and what, and what we do, uh, when maybe not, it's not a hard sell, but it's like, we're talking about our technology and how it can enable again, the, the re the reason they've come to the website, um, moving on to desire. So now they, they know who we are. Um, and, and it's really just a case of this is where PPC can come in. You know, you've got people who, who are going to click on a buying term. They've already done their research. They've already gone through our funnel and now they just want to, they just want to get started. So I think the key, here, and, and this, this aligns so much with what Phil spoke about is it's understanding the data. I think there's so much hidden data in people's websites and to, to Phil's point in, in Google, um, you, you need to understand it and then use that data to help with your plan. I think one thing we did, which worked really well is we actually took the PPC data. We started analyzing the keywords that were bringing in, um, traffic, but maybe going back to the efficiency, they were converting, but the cost per click and, and the cost per lead was so high that it wasn't efficient. So instead of spending the money via PPC, it took time, but we built SEO content around these around these keywords, and that a, a allowed us to continue to get traffic from those terms. Um, we also used the data to, to to look for our ideal customer, and you know, looking for building that kind of ideal customer plan. So instead of just creating content for content's sake, we're now starting to personalize it for different verticals, different industries, um, even different personas within a business. So again, I think like really knowing who you're looking for helps, helps with creating that content. 
this is pretty much like a high level way we look at like the, the buying journey and i think splitting it down into these sort of simple brackets uh, a problem some knowledge or, or getting over the line is a really easy way to to create to create the content so a problem you know in this example i've put i need to manage a global team now the way to think about this is the person doesn't know that our solution is out there they have a problem all they need to all they're trying to do is solve their problem and what we're trying to do is serve up the correct content so they they are searching to solve their problem we're explaining how we solve their problem and by doing that we're adding value to them automatically by just sharing how we can solve their problem but also uh, we're, we're starting to build people into our funnel which you know ultimately if, if we do a good job they're going to make it through and through um and then again going back to this you know people have some knowledge so they may be searching for the best video platform or they may be searching for a competitor uh one thing at ring central we don't do is we we don't we try not to talk badly on competitors but what we will do in going back to what i spoke about earlier with knowing your data is we will use the, the industry news and leverage certain things that are out in the industry so you know we'll, we'll talk about our security and maybe there's some some information out in the news at the moment which around the competitors and, and you know issues they're having with security we'll leverage that in our messaging um ultimately we try and align to, to this sort of methodology which really it's like if somebody's going to switch the green here I'll just the green here and here is like why they're why they're going to switch so they've got a problem with their current product they're attracted to your product so the attraction would be you know you you're really creating content that sells what your product does and how it can help but everyone's going to have anxiety about changing it's a new product it's new technology they've you know alliances and and and, and uh, habits are, are ingrained in all of us it seems like a lot of work to change you know something for us something which you may have been messaging with your team for six months or, or you know six years on, on one platform so to come in and switch that over to a new platform does cause a lot of friction and i think you know we try and message throughout the buying journey so people know why they would make that change um so once we've collected all this information and we started creating the content now we're at a point where we're growing our, our uvs and i think this is where we get into like conversion rate um, I love this talk from from Larry Kim, and funny enough, as I feel like I'm just ganging up, ganging up on Phil here, but as Phil mentioned, uh, he founded WordStream, so WordStream's a, a great tool if if you want to go and look at it. Um, but yeah, he talks about conversion and, and how high conversion rates can be, and this is kind of where we created this methodology where we align conversion rate optimization and SEO, and the reason is is like it becomes this evergreen loop. Like as a as a marketing org, we'll focus on this section here. We're going to focus on increasing unique visitors, you know, through social and and content and influencers and, and any way we can. And then we're going to start A/B testing. So we're going to get people to the website. And instead of just saying, okay, we've done our job, they're on the website. We're now going to start testing. So we'll test different form components, different page designs, different copy. Uh, we'll also test the entire journey, so from add to to close, you know, test one version against a different version, and then the business is going to benefit with with more money, you know, more lifetime value from their customers, um, which ultimately gives us more money to put into content and into testing, which then in in turn gives the the business more money. So it becomes this evergreen loop, which when you get into this position it's great because you're able to go and ask for more budgets you know you, this is something you can start quite small with and increase and increase and increase the more it proves itself out the more you can ask for money and i think via testing like you're never taking too big a risk so it's like you the business trusts you you make sure that the decisions you're making are working and then you go and invest more money this is a, a real quick look of just how how these numbers can like compound to to really start making a difference so if we were to focus entirely on growing the unique visitors by 20 percent um 
you would end up with a 20% growth in 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 in, uh, in AMR. And the same here for for conversions. You know, if we only focused on 20% conversion in AMR, we'd end up with the same growth here. And just to be clear, like I've used the baseline metric here for the average revenue per acquisition, the opt to close, and and lead to op. But this is where things start compounding. So if you're able to increase your unique visitor and your conversion rate at the same time, the, the growth is now higher. So now we're at 44%. And, and this is where you're, you're starting to see quicker, uh, quicker results. You know, your UVs are growing and your, and your conversion rate's growing. So now your leads have skyrocketed. And when you get down to numbers like this, you know, you've grown at 35%, your conversion rate's improved at 35%. It's an 82% increase compared to where we started. So I think what is to be said here is there's a lot of uh, reason to invest time and, and, and effort into the content to grow your traffic and at the same time investing in, in conversion rate. Um, I kind of created this slide which talks about the, the life cycle. So what we tend to do is, what some people tend to do is, is they'll stand up a test They'll test one thing, you know, A or B wins, and then they'll go, okay, that's done. Let's move on to another test. Whereas I think it's important to think of this as a cycle. So first off, you need to go and get that qualitative information. Talk to your customers, talk to your staff, talk to sales, find out who's doing what, you know, what's working, what's not working. If they're using certain terminology in their, in their talks, then uh, you bring that into the website. If there's key problems that they're highlighting, answer those problems in your content make sure that this all aligns then we use this like the the feedback we get from sales to build this hypothesis list and i think it's good to always have a list of tests lined up ready to go so ultimately if something fails quickly you've got something else lined up right and and you don't have to sit there idle you can start your next test and then we will start a b testing so Sometimes a website might not have much traffic and an A-B test might not be right. So then we'll do a pre-post test, which means we'll change the design, you know, complete change, but we'll monitor it and, and we'll make sure that the the results are still working out and it's working in our favor. Um, and obviously the, the more traffic you add to, to a website, the quicker you're going to get the results. And also the, the bigger the changes. So the bigger the improvement on conversion rate, the quicker you see the results. So if you're only improving it by like 5%, it, it may take you months to get a result. But if you improve it by 50%, you'll quickly see results and you'll quickly start seeing these, these changes. Um, and ultimately, th this is pretty much the, the goal that we work for. So we're working with customers and, and, and sales and, and we're gaining all this, this research uh, to know what people are searching. And again, this comes back into like SEO We'll do competitive analysis. We'll understand what our competitors are ranking for. We'll understand um, what is bringing traffic to their websites. And we'll attack that via our own content. So we're obviously going to compete with our competitors via keywords, via content, make sure that, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about our strengths against their weaknesses. And this will then start attracting new people in. And the reason I've split this out into two forms is to kind of like show how we would always have two tracks. You know, you you may be the same sort of bucket of customers, but we're going to send you down two different paths. And the reason is eventually we'll go, okay, well, experience B performed a lot higher. We saw much better revenue, saw much better lead conversion. That now becomes the control. And then we'll create a new version B to test against the new control. Um, so yeah, once, once we've got people to the web, web, website, we then focus on, supplying the relevant content and i think again this is where like you've got to have synergy between paid and seo and other channels um kira mentioned again the, the linkedin making sure that the sales team are sharing the linkedin posts uh, it aligns to what you're talking about in marketing um we do a lot of social selling so we get our sales to push out content as well and making sure that what they're sharing aligns to everything that we're talking about just it helps the business look joint up and converting so once people have you know gone back to the they've viewed the business seven times we'll go into uh, we'll hopefully convert them but 
will actually maintain exposure via the via the the buying cycle. So even though they've converted and and they've they've like signed up and are now talking to sales, we'll continue to provide that content. So our sales team will still be sharing content which is relevant to them. They will share blogs and, and videos and tutorials just to get the people over the line. And I think that's that's where a lot of marketing stops is they think, okay, leads in, you know, clean our hands, we're done. But actually it's good to support your sales team and, and make sure you get them over the line. And that brings me to this bonus bonus tip, which is aligning sales and marketing. Um, we just, I just feel that, you know, that the, or I, not just me, that the whole team, the more alignment between sales and marketing, especially if you have like a BDR organization, the, the better your programs are going to run. Um, we tend to keep, like, we have regular updates with sales teams. We have regular updates with the BDR team. We make sure that everyone knows what is going on, what campaigns are running, what events are live. Um, if I'm testing a new page, I'll explain to the team making sure that nobody's caught out because the worst thing is if a sales, if somebody in the sales team picks up a call and they don't know what the prospect is speaking about, it gives a real negative uh, vibe about the business. So alignment for sales and marketing is, is key. And ultimately, as I said, I've, I've done this really quickly because I wasn't quite sure how long I had to uh, rattle through it, but SEO and content, we use it throughout the entire journey. Um, making sure the you know the content is matched to the point of the of the journey the buyer is in so increasing our, our top of funnel content to to bring people to the website and then focus on that middle of funnel content to ed- educate them about us and then you know buy a ter- buying terms and, and just give them over the line content um i would say the the key one here is is the data really understanding your data understanding all those gems which Phil showed in in uh, Google Analytics and, and using that to create your content and also using that to to create the messaging around your pages to to solve the the needs of the customers and then you know conversion rate optimization spend the time focus on it keep iterating keep changing keep keep progressing and you know going back to Larry Kim keep going until you've got a unicorn you you want a page which converts at 11% and when you get that, then then you want to a winner. But even if you achieve that, it will go away eventually. So you have to keep going. You have to keep testing. And if you put it all together and you increase your 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 traffic and your conversion rate, then you know you can see some some great results. Cool. I hope that was uh, valuable to everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, that was a really engaging presentation. Um, I guess what we've seen across the board, and this isn't on purpose either, is that sales and marketing needs to align. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, if, if there is a key takeaway um, from our presentations that you need to make sure sales and marketing are, are aligned. Um, so what we're going to go on to now um, is uh, Q&A. Um, so there's been a few questions that have come through, so I'll, I'll kind of um, call it manage it. Um, so we've got a, a question from Harrier. Um, I'm pretty sure based on the time that would have been for Nick. Um, so the question is, does it matter if you add in images slash videos after publishing? Um, so basically if, if they went back and added in images or videos now, would it help older blogs rank better? Uh, if you updated your older blogs with new images and videos, and then you obviously updated the refresh page, so date, <clears throat> Oh, it's got a date first published, but then obviously a refreshed page. So you put that in there. And so then you also uh, go on Google Search Console and re-index that page. Yes, it will help. Cool, good stuff. Um, there's a question here for Sam. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the range of what you refer to uh, under content and what sort of a team size is that bring central to keep driving all of it? Yeah, so I mean, Content's everything. I think a content is everything. Um, in my wheelhouse, we're, we're talking mainly digital. So um, blogs, you know, web pages, video, social cards, anything that's online comes in, under us. Um, we do have product marketing who will look after certain things such as, um, you know, white papers, eBooks and, and brochures. Uh, the size of the team is, I mean, obviously we, we work with Accelerate to, to support us on content. I think 
in terms of the team, we're constantly growing. So we're about 14 in the UK now, but it's really myself focused on the digital and we've got a, a team in Manila who help out. And then um, product marketing, do a lot of uh, sort of the high level competitive stuff for us. Stuff. Um, so th there's no, um, this isn't geared towards anybody, but I think it might be a, a good conversation to have between us. Um, the, the opinion of, or the thoughts on highly targeted remarketing campaigns for B2B lead gen. So um, I might get Zhao's, um, I guess, thoughts on that first, if, if, if that's okay. Yeah, so I think at Bright Pearl, um, remarketing uh, campaigns for us means targeting our ICPs who have visited our website. So as I said, we are moving to an uh, ABM approach. So our spend and marketing spend, sales spend is focused on our ICPs. Uh, we, and also, as I said, we target a very niche uh, market. So we don't want to spend a big marketing budget or sales budget on remarketing campaigns where we can on, where uh, only 5% or 10% of the audience is our ICPs. So for us, instead of doing kind of remark, like traditional remarketing campaigns, we do campaigns uh, towards our ICPs that we have identified already, uh, which is more cost effective for us. And Sam, is that similar for you as well? Yeah, I think um, there's two sort of ways we, we approach it. So we also have an ABM strategy and obviously people, so we use tools to, to look up, you know, IP lookup to understand who the customer is coming to the website and then we'll retarget them. So if they are the correct customer profile, then, then we'll target them. Um, the other thing we'll do is, you know, we'll, we'll stack rank pages. So certain pages, if, if a customer gets to that page or prospect gets to that page, we know that they're definitely interested. And at that point, we will then start retargeting them. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we've got a lot of top of funnel content and for top of funnel content, we probably won't retarget because it is a bit of a um, hit or miss. You know, you don't know if the people are actually looking for a solution. So I think it's key to identify the pages which you think are adding value and try and bring people back to those pages. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess from an agency perspective, Nick and Phil, and feel free to whoever wants to answer this, um, what, what, what are your thoughts on highly targeted remarketing campaigns for B2B lead gen? That can be for the agency or even for, um, I guess, clients that we work with. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, take this one. Uh, so um, with sort of dynamic remarketing, uh, there's kind of ways of turning a sort of lead gen website into a kind of e-commerce site. So you get the benefits of uh, kind of clustering pages into the groups, so standard remarketing, but then you can push in a product ID based off the page or form that someone's visited. So you can um, then remarket uh, with a particular white paper or particular sort of service. So um, it's kind of a bit like pseudo e-commerce. Um, the I mean I was just finding one of the links from the, this applies to both AdWords and Facebook. Um, I've just stuck a link in the chat window. Oops, let me put that in. Uh, all um, um, uh, so the uh, there's ways and and those elements can then also be pushed into either Google Analytics as a custom dimension or into native AdWords as attributes. So if there's anything that you know about a user. Um, you can kind of use that to retarget and that's also true if they're logged in and you've got uh, kind of for instance high value users and you want to break them out and and reach them differently and um, as long as you get a minimum of about a thousand users in in one of those buckets um, then you can you can re sort of capture or remarket to those people um, there's also other things you can do with kind of getting like call center data and other like non online stuff kind of pushed in to potentially re retarget and remarket. Um, but yeah, user attributes um, would, would be um, one uh, sort of suggestion. Nice. Um, yeah, a question from me actually, um, I'll start off with Zhao. Um, what, what are your, how, how is Bright Pearl adapting to the, the new sort of climate, i.e. work from home, um, how is your team members adapting to, to sort of be in the know and ensure that everyone's on the same page? 
Yeah, so I think at Bipro, um, we were already uh, pretty flexible with working hours. Uh, so we have colleagues who are just home based. So they come into the office only uh, once a month or even once every quarter. So mm. we don't really have a big issue with working from home like policy now. But for most of the colleagues, it does make a big change uh, without seeing like your colleagues every day. So to do that, we try to uh, make the uh, communications, remote communications easier by doing Zoom conferences. We try to ask everyone to use video instead of just uh, uh, like calls or audio. And we also do more often like small catch ups uh, between teams or between team members in the same team to make sure that there is no issue in communications and we can we are on the same page and we work closely uh, to each other. Yeah, I mean, for, for some businesses, it might be a big, uh, a big change. Um, but for a lot of businesses that are kind of sort of up to date, then it is just kind of adapting this processes that are already set in place. Um, Sam, is that similar for you? Yeah, I mean, obviously we, we've we had the technology, we've been talking about the, yeah. the message since like 2000, I don't know, 12. Um, I, I think it, it, in, in a weird way, it hasn't really changed for me. I've, I've been in a position where I've been working with and managing a team in, in Manila and, and in the Ukraine for four years now. Um, what I would say is I think there's a fear or, or risk of people over, over communicating and feeling like they have to be, you know, seen. Um, so I think it's just worth like, if, if you are you've currently been switched to remote and, and you're trying to figure out how to react, it's good to send updates, but don't feel like you have to constantly jump on meetings and don't feel like you constantly have to send messages. You know, you can just send a, send what we have glip, which is our messaging tool. You can just send a glip as a quick update, and and like that's sometimes enough. You don't you don't always need to sit on a meeting for an hour. Yeah, definitely. I think it's about having that layer of communication so it is easy to communicate, um, but also um, like anything, not overkill. Um, yeah, I think that's it for questions. Um, did anybody else have anything they wanted to to cover? Um, Phil and Nick, I don't know if there's any points that you wanted to raise or questions. Uh, there was there was a question that was asked about bounce rate, which I've kind of answered uh, um, in in the in the Q and A. But the question was, uh, what is a good bounce rate for B two B? The answer is um, it's kind of it depends a bit. So um, uh, be, because it can be affected based off if there are new returning visitor, uh, the marketing channel can affect it. Like Facebook traffic might be more likely to bounce than search traffic. Uh, and also the type of page they land on, be it a blog page or a product page. So the best way to answer that question really is to look at a comparative, as in what was my bounce rate you know, this week versus last week, or this month versus the same month of the previous year. Um, the only other thing I would say about bounce rate is it's not, it's a bit of a kind of lightweight metric, because it's only really looking to see, did they just engage with that first page? Um, it's better to look at things like uh, kind of revenue or divided by not all the pages they visited, which is called goal value or page value, or even better than that is conversion probability. So those two metrics I would are more preferable than than bounce rate, although it is a starting point. Um, so yeah. Cool, nice. Um, okay, um, I think that's pretty much it for us. So we'll let everyone carry on with the evenings. But um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if there's anybody that wants to talk about some of the stuff that we do for our clients or wants any advice on uh, SEO, uh, CRO, content marketing, um, LinkedIn stuff, um, then please do get in touch. If there are any questions that come up that you think, oh, I didn't answer that, or I, I didn't um, put that in the Q&A, then just shoot them over to one of the team members and then we can um, connect with Zhao. Um, I, I think it's okay in saying um, if you want to connect to them on LinkedIn, then feel free to. Um, and just to mention as well, obviously our book um, is available to get on ebook or you can buy the, the signed the copied version uh, paperback. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. Um, survey as well. Survey. Um, in the survey, you'll have the audit as well. Um, and yeah, I look forward to the, to the next webinar, which is on the 26th of May. Thank you, Kieran.
Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.